and I'm going to start the live transcript. All right. Good, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us this morning. And we have a lot of folks that that will be that will be joining us. Um, so we'll, we'll let them roll in while we do some um, just kind of review and uh, a couple of prism updates that I'm glad to share. So um, my name is Beth Mizell, and I am the program director for Blue Ridge Prism. Um, I am joined today by Natalie Walker and Tom Sielli, who are with Blue Ridge Prism, and they will assist in managing your questions today. So a few things before we get started. The closed catch captioning is enabled or the live transcript. Um, so you can turn that off and on on your screen that we've had a lot of demand for that feature. Um, and then also the webinar is being recorded and it will be available on PRISM's YouTube channel within the next few days. Actually, I'll try to get it up this afternoon. So while you're there, please subscribe to Blue Ridge PRISM's YouTube channel and uh, later today or tomorrow, look for an email from PRISM with links to recording and any supporting materials from the webinar today. So if you're having some audio issues, um, you can uh, reach out to us in the chat and let us know or the Q&A, but generally, you know, make sure that uh, the Zoom you you're, is using your headphones and speakers. Um, you can check all that in the audio settings. And if all else fails, you can leave the meeting and come back and try again. And you can also try to use a different internet browser if, it, if it's giving you trouble. So a couple of uh, events I'd like to, to let you know about. Our next event is on August the 12th and it's our next uh, brown bag session. We're gonna be talking about Tree of Heaven and Spotted Lantern Fly in their relationship. And we'll do a deeper dive into uh, how to control Tree of Heaven. So we're, we'll be pleased to have Lori Chamberlain who's with the Virginia Department of Forestry and Tim Maywalt who's with the Charlottesville Area Tree Stewards and is also uh, one of our lead PRISM volunteers. They will be presenting that program. And you can sign up um, at blueridgeprism.org and look for um, our current programs and events. We have some fall invasive workshops planned for, the, for this October. So October 12th and 13th will be the virtual sessions on identification and control of invasive plants. And on Saturday, October 15th, we will be hosting a live in-person workshop at Penn Park in Charlottesville. So if you'd like to register for those events, you can go to PRISM's website um, and we'll have those ready soon for reg registration will open soon. And then lastly, I want you to save the date for October 18th. Uh, we will be hosting a very special guest speaker so registration details will be soon and we will announce that speaker soon formally, but you can visit PRISM's website, follow us on social media. So we're on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook and Eventbrite for program announcements and updates. I would also, uh, I'm very pleased to introduce all of you on the call today to Natalie Walker and Tom Sielli who are PRISM's new invasive management specialist. They joined PRISM in May and have hit the ground running. Um, Natalie covers Loudon, Buckier, Clark, Warren, Rappahannock, and Page. Tom will cover Nelson, Albemarle, Augusta, Rockingham, Green, and Madison counties. If you would like to send them a note or welcome, of welcome or ask them a question, please send that to info at blueridgeprism.org. So welcome, Tom and Natalie, to your first uh, PRISM quarterly meeting. Welcome to all of you. Yeah. And then I also wanted to um, let you know how close we are to wrapping up our challenge grant from the Virginia Environmental Endowment. And if you have made a contribution to this already, thank you so much for your support. 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We really appreciate it. And if you haven't, if you might consider making a contribution today, um, will you help us get to the finish line by July 31st? And I'd like to also acknowledge that many of you supported today's program with a donation at your registration. So thank you very much for showing your support. And, and lastly, we just want to thank everyone for being here today and learning about invasive plants. Um, you make a difference in protecting Virginia's natural heritage. Um, and our work at PRISM would not be possible without you. So we are sending out some PRISM love to each of you for being here and thank you. And lastly, some Zoom tips, we're all pros, but please direct your questions for the panelists today to the Q&A and that can be found at the bottom of your screen. Um, we will drop some links and helpful information into the chat for you. And uh, we're not gonna do raised hands today. So please, if you have a question, drop it in the Q&A. We just have a lot of people on the line. So right now we have 372 participants and we have left a lot of time for questions today, but if your question doesn't get answered, or you have a question about something else that's not stiltgrass related, please drop us an email, info at blueridgeprism.org, or you can find us on Facebook and send us a message there. So, and I will ask the audience today to, I know you have a lot of questions about invasive plants. Um, we all do, um, but I'm gonna ask you to, to try to limit your questions to about stiltgrass and its management today so we can keep the program rather focused. Um, so if please do that and uh, thank you. And again, if you have an unrelated question, send us an email, we're happy to answer it. So let me stop sharing my screen. I see we have a lot of uh, several things in the Q&A already. So now um, I wanted to also remind you as you leave the program today, there will be an exit survey. So please let us know how we did. Um, and you won't see that survey until you actually leave the, the webinar session. So now let's get to the good stuff, which is simply stilt grass. And I am so pleased to welcome our guest speakers today. Um, Jim Hurley and Jake Hughes. So uh, Jim will be giving his presentation first and then Jake will pick up and talk about management and control. And then we will take, uh, we'll do our Q&A session. But go ahead and drop your questions in the Q&A box and we might be able to answer a few of them along the way. I think you'll find that Jim and Jake will be answering a lot of your questions during the course of their presentation. Uh, so I would love to introduce uh, Jim Hurley. Jim is a retired organizational consultant. 20 years ago, concerned about the link between widespread degraded habitat and declining bird populations, Jim began working on introduced plant invasions in natural areas, first with private properties and public parks in Northern Virginia. And since 2013, on his and Susan Ross 156 acre property on the lower slopes of the main Blue Ridge in Greene County. The beautiful property has significant invasions of Japanese stiltgrass, multiflora rose, wineberry, Japanese honeysuckle, smartweed, perilla, and others, largely in portions of the 110 acres of forest, more in species in fields and open areas. Jim has taken the knowledge and experience gained in Northern Virginia projects and applied them on a landscape scale in green and used that experience to work on county, regional, and statewide scales with the Blue Ridge Prism. Jim is a master naturalist, a tree steward, a member of the Virginia Noxious Weeds Advisory Committee, and board member of the Virginia Native Plant Society. He also serves on the board for Blue Ridge Prism and on the board for the Piedmont Environmental Council. Now I will introduce Jake. Or Jake Hughes is a biologist specializing in invasive plants and restoration for the Shenandoah National Park. He has a Bachelor of Science from the University of Maryland College Park. 
Jake joined the resource management staff in 2005. Previous assignments include work in vegetation management at Rock Creek Park with the National Park Service in Washington, DC, and horticulture at the National Arboretum. At Shenandoah, he manages the park's invasive plant management program. His primary duties include supervising seasonal weed crews and volunteers and managing a fledgling native plant propagation and restoration program. So these two folks, they have a wealth of knowledge to share with you today. And they have been managing invasive plants for a number of years, in particular, Japanese stilt grass. So I am very pleased to host them today. And uh, so thank you, Jim, and thank you, Jake. And Jim, if you'd like to go ahead and pull up uh, your presentation and get started. Thank you. There we go. Is that good and visible? Yes, we can see it. Great. Well, thank you, Beth. Thanks, thanks for the introduction and uh, welcome. Wow, close to 400 folks on this uh, on this live webinar. Uh, that there are 400 people here, uh, all of you, uh, just indicates just how much of an irritant uh, still grass may be, if not as uh, uh, as some of you alluded to in the comments that you sent to Beth in advance. You know, even a cause for consulting therapy uh, when it when it comes to the challenges. Uh, of controlling this beast out in the landscape. Uh, so uh, it, it, it certainly was a, a beast welcoming me to the, uh, to the 156 acres uh, in, in Greene County um, when we landed there in 2013 uh, and uh, has been a big focus of my control work uh, on that property, mine and, and Susan Ross work together uh, on that property over the last uh, eight or nine years. So, uh, I am going to be covering um, identification, uh, ecology, and, and, and threats from this plant, uh, including this, uh, uh, this agenda, um, its origins, how it got here and spread in North America. We'll cover, cover some plant ID. Uh, I'm assuming that if there are so many folks here, on, uh, you all here on the uh, on webinar, um, most of you are probably very familiar with the plant uh, and, uh, and its challenges. Uh, but for those who are not fully familiar, we'll, we'll run through the characters, uh, any lookalikes um, or uh, one particular lookalike, I should say, um, that it could be confused with. Um, its preferred habitats, where it grows, likes to be, and where it doesn't prefer to be. Um, its phenology, uh, meaning the, the timing of its life cycle, uh, and its reproductive strategies, how it moves around on the landscape, uh, and ecological impacts. But before going to, into, that, um, into that list of topics, I wanted to uh, give you a little bit of potential hope uh, based on my experience with treating still grass on, on this 156 acre property uh, and, uh, and in other places too. Um, there is indeed hope. Uh, it, it can seem futile and, and Sisyphean uh, to be going after this plant, um, which has a, a deep seed bank and seems to co come in um, for all of our efforts to control it uh, from here and from there or reemerge here or there around our properties. Um, but it really is possible to make a big difference and uh, at least come close, if not totally eradicate it. Uh, <clears throat> so by way of, um, of that message of hope, just quickly give you uh, uh, an overview of our property and where we are uh, on the lower slopes of Snow Mountain, which is below the top of High Top Mountain in Shenandoah National Park. This indeed up here, if you can see my arrow in the upper left corner of the screen, that is Skyline Drive or the, the county boundary between Greene County where I am and Rockingham on the other side. And this is Route 33, headed up to Swift Run Gap, an entrance station to Shenandoah National Park. Uh, th this long, long amoeba-like uh, figure with a tail, uh, it, it, this, uh, these are properties about 500 acres or so uh, down in, in the lower slopes of Snow Mountain, which is a central ridge going up to the top of High Top. 
And this is our property right here. It's a very weird shaped property uh, in blue. These are other properties around it, uh, but this is the central core here of, uh, uh, for focus of my control efforts. But um, I needed to extend uh, focus out beyond our property too, uh, because we have about a three and a half mile road in yellow, uh, State Road 626 or Snow Mountain Road, coming down right from, uh, from, from, the, from its end up at the uh, park gate in Shenandoah National Park, as well as a power line, which is in green. And these are two major vector corridors for the transport of of uh, stillgrass down from the park. Not to blame anything on Jake here, but there are just huge concentrations of, of, uh, of stillgrass uh, up in the park uh, and they're just coming down the road. And if I'm gonna have any chance of controlling it down here in a, a lower ravine, Mesic uh, moist ravine valley is down on our property, I had to get a, a handle on it up here. Um, and so I haven't done, uh, have indeed done that, particularly along the state road. And here's another detail of, uh, of in particular, our property right here uh, and map still grass infestations around. And you can see coming down the state road, all along the state road, and then spilling down uh, through an up slope property onto our property down here. Uh, there are these trails of still grass coming down uh, from the slope. And, but the relief here, just to give you a, an indication here too, is uh, well, the, the, the topography. This is at about uh, 1,200, uh, 1,250 feet down to about uh, 800 feet, 750, 800 feet down here. So about a 500 foot drop in elevation over about 800 yards or so on this, this part of the property. And that's, that's the roadside um, um, of Snow, Snow Mountain Road. You can see on both sides uh, and there are berms. There were berms back in 2013 along the roadside that extended a good three and a half miles. Uh, uh, intermittent, but mostly prevalent along the roadside for those three and a half miles beginning in 2013. And here's one of the big berms uh, right, right above our property on an upslope side, go down this way and uh, across the road and our property drops down from the road from there. So slathered on roadside berms. Uh, and then transported down uh, via culverts from the upslope side uh, uh, where the ditch was uh, underneath the road with, uh, via this culvert uh, down dumping onto our property. Uh, and here you can see, uh, here's that pipe up here uh, coming down and a ditch and a, uh, uh, a gathering of, of roadside gravel. And this scene uh, spilled down slope, the roadside gravel could be found down slope uh, at least 200 yards. And in mixed in, into that, uh, into that gravel, gravel was all this uh, still grass seed spilling down slope with it, um, driven by surface flows, big rains coming down on, on, onto the roadside, uh, traveling into the ditches, collecting uh, big streams, dumping through the culvert down onto our property. Resulting in this, big still grass glades coming down slope, more still grass glades, more still grass glades. There's me in the middle of a, a thick glade on the upper part of our slop, uh, property. Susan uh, taking a shot at, uh, at one of those glades with herbicide. And here is one, one big glade pre-treatment. Oh, that sounded pretty depressing up to this point, I think, but here, here's where I wanna give you hope. Uh, and this is what it looks like or looked like maybe only three or four years later. I don't have a date on the slide, but it's looking even better now uh, than it was then. Uh, and so this is this photo taken at, uh, at, uh, uh, in midsummer, um, pre-treatment um, for any remaining still grass after let's say three or four years of treatment. Uh, and this is the scene as well up on the roadside. I just surveyed up on the road uh, two or three days ago um, went up in the car pretty much up to the park boundary and found little to no still grass uh, along the way. Um, that was after four or five years of uh, one treatment per year with a, uh, with a, uh, a grass specific herbicide that left the other vegetation uh, harmless uh, or unharmed and, um, and only killed the still grass. 
largely controlled around that uh, on the berms on, on the roadsides. So it is possible to get handle on this thing um, and uh, release good plants that have been suppressed by it. On the other hand, uh, this uh, slide also shows an infestation of perilla, which is also coming down the roadside with the, with the, uh, with the control of the stiltgrass, more perilla was released. Uh, and this came down in a big wash uh, from that storm culvert from above too. So uh, even with, with, the rele with uh, relief from stiltgrass, you're still gonna have perhaps um, some follow-on infestations of other weeds uh, too that need to be controlled. Uh, and here I am getting ready for a session of work and uh, over the left uh, uh, fender of this, of this old tractor, uh, you can see a wash of still grass out there, which is gonna be my target. At this point, this is all pleasingly brown and not green. Um, not yet uh, repopulated with native plants for the most part, although we're getting going on that, but the still grass is virtually 100% gone from this area. Uh, I wanted to slip in this slide right here because I don't have a better place to put it uh, because there were a couple of questions about how to uh, or a, a contact VDOT or whether VDOT permits are possible uh, to obtain uh, to contain still grass along roadsides. So I'm just going to flash this slide for you. Perhaps we come back to it later uh, with information on, uh, on how to contact VDOT for a land use permit uh, to spray herbicide on VDOT roadsides, which is what I did um, and have done and will do uh, in about a month or so again for any remaining patches here and there. Uh, along that three and a half mile stretch. Okay, so to, to turn now to the, um, to the major agenda items, where did this plant come from? What's its origin and, and distribution? It's native to East Asia and was first collected in Knoxville, Tennessee uh, in this area in 1919, uh, examined and identified uh, as likely uh, coming uh, from packing material on a shipment from China. It's named Japanese still grass, but um, uh, what I've read is that that really expresses uh, an etymological preference um, for uh, things Japanese uh, back there around the, uh, the turn or the first couple of decades in the 20th century in the US um, because uh, it likely came from China and is perhaps even more prevalent in China and other countries of South Asia, Southeast Asia, even then in Japan. Uh, there, uh, I've got some, some critical dates there for you when it arrived in Virginia, Alabama, uh, and uh, Pennsylvania, and it's movement up into New England. And this is an EDMAPS um, distribution map showing its presence uh, as uh, in the east and spilling over uh, into on the west side of the Mississippi River, uh, you know, into Arkansas and Oklahoma and uh, Louisiana and even into Texas uh, 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 in a screen grab that I took just a couple of days or so ago. So that is very re recent information on where it is uh, in, in the country. And you can see in Virginia, every last county uh, has still grass and it has been found and there are vouchers um, in every last county, uh, voucher specimens. And so the still grass is in the herbaria uh, of, uh, of herbariums throughout Virginia. Is it a noxious weed in, uh, in Virginia? No, while it is in, in, in 43 states, and we have not been able to get it through the noxious weed process in Virginia because the uh, noxious weed law in Virginia requires a permit to move any part of the plant around the landscape. And at this point, there is not yet a provision in the law, although we've been lobbying for this with our, our counterparts in DNLA uh, and the Farm Bureau and with uh, uh, with the Department of Agriculture, uh, a change in the law to allow for incidental movement uh, that would not require a, move, a, a, a permit. Nevertheless, nobody is selling this plant uh, in Virginia, so uh, its, uh, its elevation to noxious weed status in Virginia is not going to uh, slow it down from sale in the trade, which is not happening. But uh, I think that, that the primary reason to put it on the noxious weed list is just a message to the public, um, folks like you all and more 
um, getting the word out that this, this indeed is a noxious plant that is having a huge impact on Virginia's natural areas. To turn to plant ID and, and key characters, uh, it, there are six or seven of these. Here's a really nice photo of the plant uh, in full, uh, uh, a, a fully grown plant with its, I've got further slides showing its silvery off-center uh, leaf midrib. But here you can, you can see as well the alignment uh, or spacing of the leaves along the stem, which are pretty evenly distributed. Um, one to three spikes on flower stalks, multiple stems on large plants. And here you can see one, one central stem uh, that has given rise to several branches and, and rebranching. Uh, and you can, you can find plants like this that go up five, six, seven feet. Uh, if the plant has something to climb onto and be supported by, uh, that will encourage its, its branching out and the, and the generation of multiple, multiple stems um, with multiple inflorescences coming out the end of those stems too. It's an annual plant, so it's got a weak root system. And this, this is uh, an indication of just how weak it is. And it's easy to pull out. That's a distinguishing character uh, from uh, perennial plants, which have a more robust uh, root system, such as white grass, which I will show you later. Um, and a reason that it is called, called still grass is because uh, when, uh, when the plant might be bent over and a node might touch uh, the ground, it can root from those nodes. And you'll see the plant uh, seeming to walk across the, uh, the, uh, across the ground. And you can have the same plant extending out a foot, 18 inches uh, or, uh, or more. Um, as it, it roots from notes down into the ground. So here's a shot of seedlings uh, as early as April 5 uh, in 2020. And if it looks like that looked that way on April, April 5, uh, the germination occurred prior to that. And these were even smaller, let's say several days prior. Uh, April 29th, they've grown larger, even though this is a close up, these are our, our larger seedlings. Um, and here's the, the, the plant um, uh, mature, mature size, engulfing common milkweed, and so milkweed. So that's probably up two, three, four feet, depending on the on the height of that milk uh, that milkweed plant. The silvery midvein. This is going to be going to be the primary character uh, to identify uh, the, the plant by. Absolutely recognizable character. And if you just, if, for those not familiar with the plant, if you just um, you know, fixate on this character on the shape of the leaf, which is not symmetrical, here's the mid vein here or here. And you can see the mid vein is off center and there's a part of the leaf that extends further out and uh, excuse me, uh, on, an, on a kind of an oval uh, from the other side of the leaf. Um, primary identifying character. Here it is bolting uh, in, in the late summer and you can see uh, the end of the, of the stalk beginning to elongate uh, and the leaves become thinner and extend out, uh, seeming to extend out further. Uh, at this time of year, it, it can become more difficult to distinguish from uh, Virginia white grass years ago, Virginica, because of the thinness of the, um, of the leaves. But that, that, mid, that mid vein, that silvery mid vein will still be evident. There can be up to three spikes uh, on a terminal inflorescence uh, or flower stalk uh, of the plant. And here's, a, here's a shot of still grass in, uh, in full seed at the end of the summer. You can see just how elongate and how, how the, the leaves uh, become much thinner and occupy much less visual space in here. And if you, if you looked at this, uh, at this infestation, let's say a month or six weeks prior, you might not be able to see much of the, of let's say this is a barn uh, background you know, through, the, through the leaves. Everything is stretching upward all the energy of the plant is going into seed generation at this point. 
Uh, and here's what it looks like slathered on the roadside um, after it being uh, controlled with a selective grass specific herbicide that Jake will cover later. And here's what it looks like in winter, the, the thick, deep thatch uh, slathered all over uh, the, the landscape from thick infestations. Its preferred habitat um, is full sun uh, to part shade, but it'll also grow in shade. Uh, and you'll, you'll, you'll see that in a under a closed canopy uh, where the ground growing conditions are favorable, uh, where there may be little, uh, where there may be little leaf litter uh, and where the, the soil is relatively moist. Uh, so moistness does help. Um, lower slope floodplain forests and stream banks, you probably all noticed it there, along forest edges where it gets enough light and maybe there's enough moisture there too. Road and trail edges uh, where it's spread by tires and, um, um, and boots. Moist fields, ditches, and lawns. Increasingly, it's becoming a threat uh, to farmers uh, and they're in their hay fields uh, and uh, as well as in their pasture fields where, uh, where their animals do not prefer stilt grass to other more nutritious grass, grasses. Lawns are a particular challenge, uh, control challenge, which perhaps uh, Jake will uh, jump into and uh, can be found in ditches and uh, areas that are that are vulnerable to flooding and surface water flows. That's a chief mode of transport. Uh, it's uh, a, it doesn't do well in deep leaf litter uh, and in poor and dry soils, acidic soils, uh, and during in, and, and inside deer exclosures too, indicating how it moves around again, how it moves around on the landscape. Just a, a quick slide on uh, on um, surface water flow. How this was that ditch. Here's the road up here, road up here, spilling down this this ditch several hundred yards into you know big uh, infestations and glades further on down on the property. Further on down, and here it is controlled at that at that very pipe on the down. So up on our, our side of the road, uh, the downslope side, and uh, here's the road surface and here's, you know, go back about 15 feet or so from here to here. And that's the opposite side, uh, the, the embankment or berm not yet controlled there. One grass that I think that it can be confused with, which is uh, often found intermixed with it is Virginia white grass or Leurisia virginica. It's got a longer, thinner leaf, however, with no silvery mid vein. Um, and another way to distinguish it as well is that it is well rooted given that it's a perennial as opposed to still grasses being an annual. Uh, so uh, if you give a tug on white grass and it doesn't pull out easily, it's, uh, it's likely to be white grass and not still grass. Reproductive strategies, it's an annual. Uh, meaning that each plant lives and dies in one growth season. It's as an annual, its reproductive strategy is to generate as much seed as it possibly can per plant, small plants, maybe only 10 or so seeds, to large seeds with multiple uh, plants with multiple stems, thousand or more seeds. Um, the established populations generate extensive seed banks that can take more than five years to exhaust. And that's just assuming that as well, assuming that no new seed is introduced either from animals bringing it in or missing any particular plants if we're trying to control it uh, in that seed, uh, in that infestation, missing no plants that are allowed to go to seed again and contribute uh, to, the, uh, to the further uh, uh, extent of that seed bank into the future. Uh, good news is that seed viability and germination rates decline over time. Um, but uh, you know, five years is still a significant amount of time, even though we'll see a sig significant drop off in, in, gener in, uh, in germination at the end of year three. A uh, uh, question that uh, could, could be raised here is whether, um, uh, whether the plant stillgrass, which is um, uh, spread across the East uh, so aggressively over the last hundred years, 
has been assisted um, by um, uh, its variable seed viability. That is, if we're controlling it, um, uh, um, if, if, if we're controlling it up to five years, but some plants still get through and no, no, new, no new seed has been introduced uh, after the first control and you end up uh, getting some germination in year six, seven, and eight, and that, uh, uh, that seed is not then controlled, then in effect, we may be selecting for longer, uh, longer seed viable seeds, uh, seed banks viable seeds. Um, question I'd raise for, for ongoing research there. Uh, it's life cycle timing or phenology. Uh, it germinates from late March and into June. Uh, and it uh, reaches maximum size for site conditions through uh, mid-August. And as I said before, that could be as small as, let's say, two or three inches in, in a closed, closed canopy, uh, difficult soil and moisture conditions uh, in a forest to up to six, seven, eight feet, uh, where it's got optimal growing conditions, moist soil, rich soil, uh, and shade full, uh, uh, part shade of, uh, to full sunlight. Its bolting begins, that means the elongation or the stretching of the inflorescence uh, uh, as early as the third week of August uh, with a transition from vegetative growth to reproductive growth and that energy shift uh, there uh, uh, expressed in the lengthening of the inflorescence and the thinning of the leaves. All the, the energy is going into seed production. And seed production can last into October, uh, again, with implications too for control into, uh, into the fall. Some quick slides again on what it looks like early, full in full swing in summer, bolting. It's flowers come in two uh, categories, chasmogamous and cleistogamous. Those uh, chas or chasmogamous flowers, they're on the terminal inflorescences, uh, are open to wind uh, pollination. Um, and as, as opposed to cleistogamous flowers, that are contained within the sheaves of branchlets that are low on the stem, which never open, never show, and they self-pollinate. Um, it, it, it could be a reproductive uh, advantage uh, that is cleistogamy or the ability to, to self-pollinate within leaf stems um, or leaf sheaths uh, because it requires less energy to do so, you know, not generating open flowers, which typically uh, uh, re require more energy to generate. And uh, uh, though uh, the cleistogamous flowers uh, can uh, favor seed production even on challenging sites, poor soils, deeper shade, drought, et cetera, less energy required, perhaps more seed, produ uh, seed production, even in challenging conditions. So I wonder about this as another research question too, um, uh, whether the cleistogamous and the chasmogamous uh, seeds develop in different, um, with different timing, um, which might change uh, control strategies. There's an example of uh, the inflorescence or uh, chasmogamous flowers, three perhaps on the, on the end of an inflorescence, and uh, one of these small branchlets coming off low in the stem, and the seed is contained within this sheath. Spreading mechanisms. Uh, their animals um, uh, include chiefly deer. I, I'd refer you all to uh, uh, a study done by the Smithsonian Conservation Biology Institute, or SCBI, of a 20-year, nine-acre deer exclosure that uh, demonstrates uh, stiltgrass exclusion from the exclosure, as well as sapling health, uh, where saplings were, on average, two and a quarter times higher uh, and four times greater uh, diameter at base height uh, uh, in the exclosure plot versus the reference sites. Um, so much more survivability of saplings, woody plants uh, in deer exclosures. Uh, so we got you know, deer herbivory, herbivory uh, is one issue uh, and then still grass uh, growing over uh, seedlings and saplings and, and reducing viability of them. Uh, surface water flow, I indicated before too, and you can see that uh, on slopes 
uh, where you might have a significant rainstorm, you know, two, three, two, three inches on, let's say, 10%, 20% slopes, which washes down slope. Uh, and then when it runs out of gas, the, the surface flow runs out of gas, uh, it, uh, further upslope, it has scoured the seed bank uh, and pulled out seed from, uh, from the upper soil layers and transported it down slope. And where that, uh, where that flow sort of runs out of gas, it drops the seed and you end up with these mustaches or lines that could be you know, five, 10 feet in, in, in depth, down slope to upslope uh, across the across the slope um, where the, the slope grass has been transplanted. Uh, also along floodplains and uh, uh, versus in size streams. Uh, in general, ecologically, we like to have uh, our streams connected to our, uh, to our floodplains. But with respect to the slope grass control, I have found that if you got a, a stream charging through your, uh, through your forest, at two or three feet below floodplain height, um, any stillgrass transportation from upslope further up where it's fallen into or it's been scoured from the floodplain uh, further upslope, it's just going to be transported through your property or that section of your property uh, in an incised stream uh, versus uh, a, a, a stream that is allowed to uh, spread out over a, a floodplain in a big surface flow. Heavy equipment uh, disturbance in forests, for example, forest mulchers and logging operations uh, tend to release uh, an existing seed bank as well as move it around. Uh, and then lastly for, you know, or not lastly, uh, hikers and boot hygiene, but I wanted to, uh, to stress mow, blow and go long uh, operations, landscaping uh, uh, equipment um, uh, are one, one, if not the primary way that this plant is moving around urban and suburban settings uh, from lawn to lawn, and uh, it's being transplanted. Uh, with a hint there to all of you, uh, if you're not already, uh, and you're in an urban suburban situation, uh, to talk to your um, landscapers about um, equipment hygiene. Ecological impacts, um, uh, allelopathy, it, it tends, the, the, the plants release chemicals for the root system that inhibit the growth of other plant species. And it can alter nu nutrient recycling uh, for other organisms like mycorrhizal fungi. Uh, it can shade out herbaceous woody plant seedlings affecting uh, uh, forest regeneration. And then that thick thatch uh, inhibits germination and growth of other um, uh, beneficial plant species. There it is engulfing. Um, and there's that thick thatch again, inhibiting germination. So uh, all of these features of the plant uh, have implications for control. Um, the life cycle and phenology um, and a mixture with native grasses and forbs, preferred habitats, ecological impacts, modes of spreading. Uh, they generate different options and strategies to control this beast of a plant uh, that is running rampant over our natural areas. And so I think with that, I'll hand it off to Jake, who will go into uh, control strategies and options. That was great. Thank you, Jim. And we have a lot of questions, and we'll, we'll put those questions on hold until uh, the end of Jake's presentation. Okay. All right, thanks, Jim. Um, so I'm Jake Hughes. I, uh, um, as Beth said, I uh, work at Shenandoah National Park, and um, I love I love killing stiltgrass. Um, <laughs> I look forward to stiltgrass every, every year. Uh, um, I went out this morning, and unfortunately, I didn't have to go very far. I found some stiltgrass, uh, photographed it this morning. So uh, this is this is what um this is what I'm seeing out there this this very morning. Um, uh, got some shots here. 
um, of a uh, forest opening not far from my office. So um, kind of in a shady spot up here in the upper left. It's, it's probably getting eight, 10 inches tall. Um, over here on the top, top right, I've got a photo of some, some uh, lawn along the roadside that was mowed probably two weeks ago. So you can see it coming back a um, couple inches tall. Uh, couple sprawling plants down here in the lower lower left, um, and um, and then a, a vigorous patch right in the middle of the forest opening where they're getting a, where the plants are getting a lot of light, um, uh, probably going on a foot and a half tall or so. So that's what I'm seeing right now. Um, and what I'm hoping to cover, uh, I want to leave, leave a lot of time for questions. But I'm, what I'm hoping to cover uh, is a lot about the 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 various ways that you can kill this beast. Um, Stokegrass is easy to kill, not necessarily easy to keep keep um, from coming back, but it's certainly easy to kill. Um, so I want to talk about some control methods. Um, I say I say maybe someday next to a biological control down there because while there is a there is a leaf blight, a, um, a fungal pathogen out there that's been talked about as a potential biological control, um, it, it's seems to be a long way off and it's it, it does have an effect on some other grasses so um so things aren't looking too great at the moment so there isn't a whole lot to talk about right now with biological control unfortunately but, um and i'll also talk about some uh some things to keep in mind over the long term if you're um, attempting to manage still grass and a little bit about restoration so let's start with some control methods so we'll start with manual control you know good old hand pulling um sometimes hand pulling is an option uh, after you've after you've done that two or three years of, of treatment and knock the knock the population back and you've got scattered scattered plants to deal with you know you hand pulling is is an option um, that uh, that can be employed um uh if you're lucky enough to have a spot where it's just getting started you can also hand pull in, in places like that and um and timing on on hand pulling you know, should, you, you want to get it. You want to start hand pulling before, um, or, or I'm sorry, after germination has has ended. So you don't want to go in there. And you can, but <laughs> you probably don't want to go in there. Start pulling the plant uh, while while plants are still coming up from the seed bank. So so July until the seeds start falling from the plant is is a is a good uh, good timing on on hand pulling. And um, usually you, around here we usually start to see the seeds fall from the plant in in mid-September um, here in the Shenandoah Valley. And, um, and you'll see, they, as, as soon as they start to mature, they really just, they, they, they tumble off the plant with, with just, just by brushing up against one of those, one of those inflorescences that, uh, that Jim showed. And I've got a couple of photos of some, of some seeds um, down at the bottom of this screen. Of course, there are some downsides to manual control. Um, if you've got anything but a small infestation, uh, it, <laughs> it quickly becomes ridiculously labor intensive and uh, it can result in a lot of soil disturbance, uh, pulling up all those plants. Uh, this, this slide shows a uh, four, four meter by four meter plot that was uh, hand pulled as part of a research project. And, and all of those, those, those three stuffed bags uh, um, uh, came from that that one four by four meter area. So um, obviously a lot of work, hundreds and hundreds of hours per acre. There are some other reasons why you might not want to consider hand, <laughs> hand pulling. Um, here's a nice uh, copperhead guarding his uh, his his still grass patch. Um, we we uh, here at the park in have also noticed that that uh, crews tend to pick up a lot more ticks when you're down there uh, hand pulling weeds so um that, that that may be a downside to um to manual removal of uh of still grass if uh if you're in a ticky part of the country so uh, mechanical control is is an, certainly another option and, and here we're talking about um uh techniques that that physically destroy the plant uh, to um, or, or, or damage it enough so that it doesn't it doesn't have a chance to, to produce seeds and um, one option that that is that is has um, been shown to be effective is um, is flaming with a propane torch so they make these specialized um, 
uh, propane torches for um, for uh, um, uh, heating and burning burning weeds. And we're talking we're not talking about putting flame fire on the ground. We're not talking about lighting the ground on fire, but we're we're talking about applying directed heat to the plants to cause cellular damage. And uh, just 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 kind of waving that that hot torch flame over the plants uh, causes them to um, causes the cells to essentially explode and, and, and the top part of the plant to be destroyed. And uh, that tends to work best early when the plants are small. So, um, so following, uh, following germination, once germination is stopped in, in June is, is a good time to, to do that. Um, uh, another mechanical control technique that, that is definitely effective is uh, cutting the plants with a string trimmer. And, um, and what you need to do here, you're not mowing the plants. You know, mowing to, to a couple of inches isn't, it doesn't do the job as, as, you, as you saw in that, that photo of the, the mowed roadside. You have to cut the plants at the soil surface. You have to totally remove all the above ground uh, portion of the plant. And um, if time properly, uh, say, say midsummer um, to when the plants uh, begin to flower, uh, most of the, the plants that you cut won't be able to come back from the roots. Um, it's, it's, actually, it's actually quite effective. And I've got a, got a series of photos right here on the, that show a, show a plot that was treated this, this way. And in the upper left-hand corner is, is the, uh, the, uh, the plot before treatment. Uh, bottom, bottom photo shows the plants just after they've been cut to the ground, uh, laying on the ground. And then by early September, um, the very few of the plants in that plot had, had come back. Uh, now, if you ever try this, you, you'll know that there are some downsides to this. I mean, weed whacking, using a string, trim, string trimmer in the woods can certainly be challenging with logs in the way and trees and uneven terrain. Uh, but uh, but it's, it's, you know, it's, it's certainly, certainly an effective option if you, if you, um, if you use it. Um, Cultural control me uh, methods. Now, the, this this refers to um, changing the, the the environment, changing the uh, the conditions at the site to disfavor the plant. So you're you know, you're making the plant uh, um, you're, you're changing the the conditions that allow the plant to, to establish and thrive in the first place. And um, and as as Jim alluded to. Uh, Deer management uh, can can really help you with stilt grass and and a lot of other other invasives. But um, you know it may be the case that all you need to do with your property is manage deer, be it with a fence or with other uh, less friendly methods. Um, uh, you hear people talk about prescri prescribed fire for invasives. Um, while there is some evidence that a spring spring burn can set it back, and uh, there is certainly um, reason to, um, to believe that you can, you can um, combine prescribed fire with other treatment met, uh, methods, uh, like with, a, with an herbicide application. Prescribed fire uh, by itself is probably not gonna help you much with stuff grass, and it may even make the situation worse. Um, uh, planting um, highly competitive species, I mean, that is, that is potentially an option for stuff grass control. Um, uh, they're um, planting, um, if you're dealing with stillgrass in a, in a field, uh, getting uh, large statured warm season grasses established like, uh, like say Indian grass could, um, could help exclude a lot of, uh, a lot of stillgrass. The trick there is getting the plant established um, and uh, knocking the stillgrass back enough to allow the, the, the plants to, to establish and, and, and grow. Um, and then I, I also add here, um, eliminating unnecessary disturbance. So um, if, if you're dealing with a situation like stillgrass in a lawn, you want to make sure you're not cutting the lawn too close. I mean, I've seen a lot of situations where it appeared stillgrass established after um, regular close mowing and scalping of the ground. So you want to you keep from doing things like that, certainly. Uh, a little bit more about deer. So, so it's it's pretty well established. There, there are quite a few uh, papers out there that um, that um, um, uh, suggest that the deer are having a um, 
a uh, real impact on, on the landscape with regard to uh, to, to um, still grass um, or with still grass establishing right? They're impacting the landscape in a lot of other ways too certainly but but um, but between um, eating natives you know preferentially browsing on native plants that ordinarily would compete really well with still grass and by disturbing leaf litter uh, deer clearly have a huge role play a huge role in in um, and uh, allowing stillgrass to establish and, and thrive. Um, there's even some evidence that um, that if you have stillgrass on a site and you keep deer out, that um, that the uh, the invasion may be reversed by by keeping keeping deer out of an area or reducing number numbers of deer. Um, it's it's a little bit. The evidence is a little bit equival equivocal at this point. Some people say you need to control and you need to control still grass and remove deer, but uh, but others have found a good response. A reduction, seen a reduction in still grass, a rebounding of natives, uh, just simply by reducing deer. So, all right. Uh, so chemical control. A lot of generally, if you're if you're doing a lot of still grass control, you're you're if you're if you're um, if you've got a big problem, you're probably going to resort to uh, to chemical chemical control at some point. And um, and I um, I'm, I'll discuss uh, sort of four groupings, four four categories of, of chemical chemical control here that have shown at least some degree of of uh, effectiveness effectiveness on uh, stilt grass. And um, and uh, I just got a note down here, you know. Whenever you're using herbicides, you know, please, 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 it's the law. Make sure that you're you're following and understanding all label directions when you're when you're using using uh, herbicides. So, so Jim mentioned um, grass specific herbicides. So these are these are herbicides that target only grasses, um, and uh, there there are a whole host of products. There, um, they uh, all have have funny. Uh, Active ingredient, funny, funny, um, active ingredients with funny names like fluazafop and phenoxaprop and cethoxidim, plethidim, and um, I've got a uh, a note down here at the bottom, a a, um, a reference down here at the bottom that uh, that that lists a um, uh, a whole host of of species. Uh, I'm sorry, of uh, uh, pre of um, pesticides, herbicides that have been used and um, to to control control still grass. Um, one product that, that, that I'm pretty familiar with that we use here uh, at the park a fair bit is, is, um, is a, a, um, an herbicide um, uh, called a fluizafop. And um, the actual, the brand name of the product that we use is called Fusilade. And, um, and you can use a very low concentration of this product. Um, uh, Fusilade is 24% uh, fluazofop, fluazofop, and we use uh, just a quarter percent of it, um, which which equates to uh, just just the 0 0.06 percent of, of the active ingredient. Um, you can go to go to the hardware store and and uh, pick up Grass Be Gone, an ortho product, and that also contains fluazofop, and uh, it's it's um, has a slightly higher concentration than the uh, than than what you really need to um, to uh, to kill stilt grass, um, so you can you can dilute that to a to about a twelve point eight eight percent solution, and uh, and and um, and get good, good results on stilt grass. It's it's very very uh, very easy to kill stilt grass with this this product and and many others. Um, downsides to these products are that they're they can be rather expensive, and um, you cannot use them anywhere near water. They're, they're for upland areas only. Uh, for sure, they're they're the most they're they're all pretty toxic to aquatic uh, aquatic organisms, and um, they also tend to be rather smelly. So uh, so it's just something to be certainly certainly to be a, be aware of. Timing in those is is um, you know again uh, anywhere anywhere after germination stop from say June through through August maybe even to September before before seed production starts. So. Uh, here's a photo of a uh, of a patch of ground that was treated with one of these these grass specific herbicides. Um, 
and uh, you can see the stokegrass is just just kind of melts away, and the the uh, forbs, the other plants that are mixed in with it, are, are, are totally unscathed. Uh, this, this this gallium here is is just totally unbothered by it. Um, so they're they're highly selective. Another option uh, that 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 you may use, particularly if you're dealing with with stiltgrass in an area near water, is um, a very low rate of uh, glyphosate. You know, you know, we're talking about the Roundup uh, Roundup Custom uh, Roundup uh, uh, Rodeo. Um, uh, there, there are a whole host of products out there. Some some are suitable for for um, use near water. Uh, some not. So you, know, you need to need to pay attention to that. Um, but uh, you can, with, with products that contain 50%, around 50% glyphosate, you can use as low as a 0.1% concentration effectively on, on still grass. Uh, and that, you know, that equates to, to just four tenths of an ounce for a full three gallon backpack sprayer. Um, and, uh, and that's, that, that, then we'll do the still grass in, and it's not completely 100% effective. It will also injure other plants that 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 may be exposed to the spray, um, but it likely won't kill everything. It's it's um it at that low rate, it's it, it's it's somewhat somewhat selective. Um, timing for that, I I would say is is probably July through August. You're you're probably better off letting the plants get some size. That way, that way, anything that's growing in with the still grass is a little bit, little bit better protected by the by the spray, and um, and uh, again here a couple of couple of plots before and after this this plot here was was treated with with 0.1 percent rodeo, so a glyphosate product um, uh, with with a uh, with a surfactant added, um, and uh, and um, in uh, by early September, all the still grass in, in the plot was dead. Um, there wasn't much else left, so it doesn't look too pretty. But, but uh, you know, you, you really do not need much herbicide in general to, to, to kill still grass. It's, it's a delicate little plant. Um, I know some, some folks don't like synthetic herbicides. Uh, you know, they don't really want to use something like glyphosate or a grass specific herbicide. Uh, there are there are actually organic or, or you know so-called green herbicides that are um, are effective on still grass. Uh, horticulture horticultural vinegar, so acetic acid, um, is has been shown to be effective. Uh, this this um, article that I that I uh, referred to down at the bottom of the screen um, found that uh, the researchers there found that five percent acetic acid. So um, so I guess that would I think horticultural vinegar is typically around 20% acetic acid, so so 25% horticultural vinegar. Um, it, it was was pretty effective on stoke grass. You know, you you burn it's it's kind of like a chemical string trimming. You, you, you burn the tops of the plants off, and uh, and they have a hard time coming back from from the roots. Um, some some downsides to these products. They um, they tend to be kind of on the expensive side. Um, they, uh, they aren't always the safest products to use, uh, you know, um, horticultural vinegar is, is a pretty caustic, caustic, uh, agent, uh, pelargonic acid, scythe, which is one I've, I've used in some applications is, uh, is, is pretty, pretty stinky stuff, pretty aromatic stuff. So, um, um, so there are, there are certainly, certainly some downsides, uh, to, to using these and, you also you also have to get really really good coverage when you when you apply these these products. Um, so you need to get you need to cover the whole plant, every plant. Um, and just a whiff of the stuff isn't going to do it. And because that's so hard to do, you often find that you have to come back uh, with a spot spray later on to get the get the plants that escape the treatment. Uh, again, kind of like with with flaming with flame weeding, uh, early treatment is best when the plants are small um, in June. Uh, you don't need as much of the um, the uh, uh, spray at that time. Uh, another um, another photo sequence just to show this 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 plot was treated with um, with pelargonic acid, which is not one of the better better um, uh, green herbicides. Uh, it sounds like acetic acid is probably a better product than than pelargonic acid. But even this this product did do 
a fairly good job. I mean, it, it eliminated a lot of the stilt grass in, in the plot. There are some, there were some plants left. This, this photo was only taken in late July. So this, those plants there would definitely have to be, have to be retreated. But if, you know, if, if you're not interested in using a synthetic herbicide like a glyphosate or like a, like a grass specific, you know, these, these, these are an option. I should also say that, you know, you, you, you're really, you're supposed to use according, you know, according to the law, you're supposed to use products that are labeled as, labeled for pest control, labeled as pesticides. You know, you're not really supposed to make homegrown um, concoctions of uh, household vinegar and that, that kind of thing. You're, you're, when, when I say acetic acid, you're, you know, if you're using it to control pests, you're really supposed to go out and get, get a product that's labeled for pest control, like, like a horticultural vinegar, so. Okay, and lastly, um, pre-emergent herbicides are, um, are a, a, a great, great option for lawns. And um, they, also, they also can expand the, the season that you have to, to work on, on stilt grass um, uh, because you're applying these before, before the plants come up in, in, in the spring. Um, and uh, there, there are various products um, that, that, uh, that are, have been shown to be effective. Uh, the, the paper by Judge and Durr that I uh, that I listed earlier in the um, in the talk they they list a whole bunch but uh, the pendimethalin pro prodiamine um, preen that you probably see in the hardware store you know these are all these have all shown to be shown to be effective um, uh, that being said there certainly are downsides to to these pre emergence um, you there are usually some plants that that escape the treatment. You usually need to do some follow-up. Uh, there, you know, you usually have to go in in the summer and, and, and you know, hand pull or spot spray some some plants that escape escape the treatment. And um, and and with still grass, I found uh, I found that you usually have to use use somewhere near the the max the maximum labeled rate for these to be to be really effective, especially if you've got a lot of still grass thatch on the ground. Some some sources say you can go lower, um, uh, but um, but I I have not found uh, I've not had great results with with going with anything much lower than the maximum application rate with uh, with the products that I've that I've tried. Um, I certainly don't want to don't want to plot don't want to uh, exceed that maximum label rate. Um, Timing on, on, on pre-emergence is uh, anywhere from, from December through, through March. So you wanna, you know, and, um, you wanna have them down and, and they need to be carried into the ground by, by rainfall or irrigation if, if you're dealing with a lawn before the plants start to germinate in April. So, um, so yeah. Um, and uh, here's a photo showing a, showing a spot that was treated with uh, one of these one of these pre-emergence uh, product called prodiamine um, 4l and um, that was treated with the uh, maximum rate in in december and uh, by uh by i think this was taken in july um, most of the silk, silk grass was gone you know the few ferns a few hay scented ferns that were in there all came up on ski there are a few a few violets in there and some other things too so. So there are plenty of, plenty of ways to kill stuff grass for sure. Um, but then of course, you've got to think about, think about the long-term, you know, how, you, how you manage this, this plant uh, beyond just, the, uh, just, just killing it in, in one season. And, um, and you know, it probably goes without saying, but, but uh, maybe the first thing you want to do is, is, is to have a goal articulated. You know, is it, hopefully you're not just, uh, Maybe you are, but hopefully you're not just trying to get rid of the stilt grass. Hopefully you're either trying to get, trying to uh, increase biodiversity in your forest, or you're you know you're trying to protect a rare plant habitat or something like that. So so you know try to figure out why you're doing it in the first place. You know maybe it's just to have a weed free lawn, um, and that'll that'll help guide your guide your management um, a fair bit. Like Jim, like Jim alluded to, expect expect to spend two or three seasons uh, minimum uh, before you see before you see a noticeable reduction. I mean, you can you can kill off a lot of the plants uh, in in um, in the first year or two and still get still get scattered plants that come up and grow ten times larger than they would have 
if, if they were competing with all the, um, the plants that, um, that were there pre-treatment. So, um, so expect, to, expect to spend several seasons before you see much result, um, with a noticeable result. <coughs> uh, always practice IPM, you know, use, use a, use a um, uh, sort of multi-pronged strategy. Don't, don't just rely on one thing. Just don't just go out there and, and, and spray, uh, uh, a grant specific year after year after year um, because you know that's probably just going to release a whole lot of other weeds you, know, you want to use multiple um, strategies i would say the gold standard is probably using a, a um, employing some type of deer management and using a grass specific a very selective herbicide um, you know if you can do that you're probably going to be in good shape i'd say um, Prioritize prioritize areas for control if you can't if you can't treat the whole property if you can't if you can't get to it all protect your high value resources so if you've got rare plants or you've got you know a special plant patch of plants on your property that you want to protect protect those first uh, it's always a good strategy to work from from the cleanest areas so the areas where the still grass is the least abundant to the to the nastiest areas you know clean up the best areas first. Um, and then uh, it's, it, it can certainly help to, 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 um, to target areas from which spread is likely. So trails, um, anywhere where, uh, anywhere that, any places that are regularly, regularly disturbed. So, so um, those, those, those culverts, those ditches that Jim was showing, you know, that those places are, are important to pay attention to too, if you, if you, you, know, if you can't get to it all right away. So. Uh, as, as Jim also alluded to, uh, you know, beware of these secondary invasions. You know, the, there's you often get other things coming in that you don't want after controlling stillgrass. Oriental lady's thumb, Persicaria longicida, uh, little pink flowers. Um, that that stuff almost always appears after we remove stillgrass in the park. Uh, Jim showed a perilla beefsteak plant. That's that's another one. So. That's another reason why you know just relying on grass specific specific herbicides may be a problem. You know, you do that, and all you're doing is releasing, releasing the um, the persicaria or the the beef steak plants. So it's it's good to it's good to use different different strategies. If you can't deal with me, if you can't deal with the uh, the source of the infestation, you know, either if you're downstream from a huge infestation or you can't really do anything about the deer. You're probably in for some level of indefinite maintenance control. Um, um, that's just just you know, gonna be the way it is. It's gonna come back. <laughs> um, it won't be as intensive as it was in the beginning. Um, you know, you can once you get it under control, you may be able to skip a year, especially if you get good if you get good regeneration of natives. Good, uh, but um, but you know, you're you're looking at a long term commitment if you can't do anything about the source. Um, uh, I also say, you know, don't spread the problem. If you if you've got if you've got a if you got a lawn with still grass in it, um, and you you haven't been able to treat it, don't go mowing that lawn after after September um, if if you can help it. Um, you know, you don't still grass on its own does not spread all that quickly. Um, it needs the help of things like water, um, late season mowing. Um, disturbance to to uh, to really be spread long distances so so be cognizant of that and um, and then you know talk to others find a support group you know um, uh, it, it always helps to talk to other people that are that are that are uh, involved in, in this this sort of effort um, and uh, and no like like Jim said though you know it, it can be done with work with with it with a sustained effort it can be done and I've, I've, you know, I've got a few photos here some before and after photos that show um, show that good good results can be had within, within sometimes within a few years. Uh, here's a section of the AT um, after just after two cycles of treatment. Uh, right here, a lot of stoke grass, not much else growing growing there in 2018. By 2021, there were there were tulip trees, seedlings coming up all over the place, uh, poke milkweed, um, uh, some other stuff we planted, some. Uh, but um, this is just this was just uh, uh, two treatments here at this site released a lot of really really good stuff. Um, another trail along the park in, in 2019. Um, after the second treatment, 
there was, there was still grass. There's, there was still a lot, a lot of still grass left that was killed by that second treatment. But you can see there's loads of stuff. This is mostly wing stem, but loads of stuff coming up, coming up that was that was just under still grass previously. Uh, trail near uh, near Big Meadows, if you're familiar with the park. Um, uh, we we spent a lot of time on this one. This is an area that's hit really hard by deer. Deer activity is really high in this area, um, and uh, it's just full of still grass. And after many years of, of, um, of treatment with a grass specific herbicide, uh, with with uh, weed whacking along the trails, and and uh, um, we also did some seeding. Um, things uh, things were, were were vastly improved. And this is mostly white snake root, a plant that deer don't like, but uh, you know. It beats a monoculture of still grass for sure. Um, another site that's that's hit heavily by deer um, took a long time, but uh, you know we, we got in um, uh, started working on it around 29, uh, 2009, and by oh a good six seven years later, uh, the still grass is mostly gone, and and um, and uh, things things were were much improved there. A little bit about follow-up restoration. Uh, you know, you may not have to do a lot of active restoration, but um, but a, a few things to, to keep in mind um, following uh, as you're as you're dealing with still grass. Uh, you know, again, you want to you want to articulate that desired condition. You want to you want to know what your goal is. You want to you want to you want to. Uh, you know, have some objective set that, you, that you're working towards, not just getting rid of rid of still grass. Uh, deer activity. Um, if you if you've got a lot of deer deer browsing, um, that's that's and you can't do anything about it. That's going to limit. That's probably going to limit what's possible. Um, I'm not saying you can't. You won't be able to improve the situation, but it's you know you're going to have to be more measured in in what you expect to expect to achieve if deer are just hammering away at everything. Um, you certainly don't want to don't want to worry too much about restoration until until you've 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 got the still grass knocked down a bit. Uh, you know, if you seed something and you still got a lot of still grass, it's not going to have any chance to establish. Uh, even if you plant stuff, uh, unless it's really huge stock, really really large plants, they're probably not going to have much of a chance in, in dense still grass. So you know, get the still grass under control. And you also might find as you as as we often do, that that as you get rid of the still grass, as the still grass declines, good stuff comes in on its own. Um, you also want to consider the retreatment um, plans. You know, you don't obviously you don't want to use if you're planning to do a lot of retreatment with grass specifics. You might not want to go <laughs> go trying to trying to establish a lot of a lot of grasses right away. Um, so. Um, there are, if you know, if, if you're just simply looking for a replacement for still grass, there are a lot of a lot of plants out there that that you know, that you can that you can choose from. And once you've got that still grass knocked back, um, you, you you can establish establish uh, um, various natives that that will will help. You know, if you, if you get a, enough of it established, will help keep it keep it at bay. Um, there are a lot of lot of native grasses that you can that you can use. Uh, one one native grass that uh, that you can probably find in your lawn right now. That that is probably a good good plant to try to get established uh, following the removal of still grass is nimble will, and it's it's ecologically very similar to still grass. It's a perennial, but it's also C four uh, uh, grass that um, so it's essentially a warm season grass that likes the same sort of habitats as still grass. Um, again, if you've got a if you've got a big open area, a big field full of still grass, establishing one of those large statu statured um, warm season grasses can can help keep still grass at bay. I'm not a huge fan of, of switch grass, but I've seen switch grass um, essentially essentially stop uh, still grass where it's where it's well established. Um, sedges are great if you know if you can find the plants. If you can find a seed source, they can be tough tough to come by, but Sedges are, you know, fantastic plants. You can treat those with a grass-specific herbicide, and they're they're un, totally unharmed. And then, if you've got deer, if, if if you're dealing with a lot of deer, they're they're, you know, think about those those deer-resistant plants. You know, in addition to the grasses and sedges, deer don't don't tend to 
tend to like uh, grasses and sedges so much. So things like white snake root and, and golden ragwort that, that will establish an abundance, even if you've got a lot of deer activity. So, so um, yeah, a few, few ideas for replacement, replacement plants there. So, all right, well, uh, with that, I think I better turn it over to um, everybody for questions. And um, got my contact info down there. Please feel free to, to contact me if you have any questions, need any info. Just want to commiserate. Um, happy to happy to do it. So, thanks for listening. I will stop sharing my screen now. All right, Jake. Thank you so much for all of that great control information. Um, so we're at twelve fifty, and um, we are going to answer as many questions as possible. And we'll probably go over a few minutes. So if you have to hop off the call at one p.m. Rest assured, this is being recorded and you'll get to hear as many questions um, if we go past one. So um, a couple of reoccurring themes that we had in our questions was about mowing. And um, could you explain why mowing stilt grass over and over can be problematic and not helpful in controlling it? And, and most of these questions were referring to, to mowing in the lawn, seeing yeah. small plants. Yeah. 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 It just, it, it's, it's amazing. You, you, if you don't, um, if you leave the, the smallest bit of, of stuff grass behind, it seems to, it seems to have enough capacity to, to flower and crank out a few seeds and reproduce. And, you know, all the single stilt grass, stilt grass plant has to do is, is crank out one seed that that uh, replaces itself, and um, <laughs> and uh, and and you've uh, you know you're you're back in that same the same situation you were. Um, you really have to get you really have to scalp. Uh, you really have to take take the whole above ground portion of the plant away. You have to cut the plants at the soil surface, and when you do that, you know they don't have the capacity to um, they don't have the ability to uh, photosynthesize anymore and and um, especially as you get later into the season, as the plants, like Jim was saying, as the plants are, are starting to put energy toward flowering and seed production, um, uh, uh, the plants can't come back from the roots when you cut them. Um, so, so yeah, you really hey, God, get God. right down at the soil surface. It's easier hey, said Jake, than Jake, done sometimes. But, so. Jake, I, I've noticed that um, the, the later you go in the season, perhaps the less radical the scalping has to be uh, yeah. Yeah. because of all that energy going into seed, into seed production. Yeah. Uh, so if, uh, if, you're, if you're in the woods, for example, with a, a spring trimmer or, or along a trail, um, I've, I've actually seen um, stilt in trails mowed with a, uh, with a bush hawk. And that's not gonna get any lower than like four or five inches or so. Yeah. But the plants that were mowed were up like Three or four feet, uh, and so if that was done at the end of uh, at the end of August before our seed production. Um, that's enough, in my experience, uh, to kill those plants pretty much dead. They just will not be able to resprout from those uh, weak roots that late in the season. Yeah, that, that's that's interesting. Um, yeah, I I um, I. Uh, that late, you gotta you gotta make sure you're not getting any any seed production from those those like from those cleistogamous plant uh, cleistogamous flowers and uh, or I'm sorry yeah the cleistogamous flowers in the leaf sheaths but um but uh, but yeah I mean, that's yeah you gotta get down below the the level of those mm -hmm. cleistogamous yeah, yeah. branchlets yeah. Yeah, and that's why still grass can be so troublesome in the in the lawn because you're mowing the lawn throughout the season and you're driving that still grass to be shorter and shorter and then it can produce seed. And when you really to effectively control it, you know, clip it down at the at the root and before it can uh, produce produce the flowers. So um, we could do a whole session on still grass in lawns and turf. And, and that's a whole, a whole other discussion. So um, thanks everyone for those questions. So we had a really interesting question um, from Shem Shemuel, and I'm sorry if I have butchered your name, um, but 
so we all agree that um, stilt grass is detrimental, but uh, they ask um, how can Japanese stilt grass contribute to agriculture and um, or architecture? You know, could could it be used as a um, some kind of landscaping plant? I would I would say not, but uh, I'm intrigued by this uh, question about agriculture because we've had a lot of questions about grazing and if stilt grass will be grazed or can it be used for cattle or will goats eat it and, and other farm animals. So thought, thoughts on that question. Per, per my discussions with farmers who are, who are having their fields, I think I may have mentioned this earlier, uh, field, fields, uh, they would say, uh, invaded by or degraded uh, by stiltgrass. Uh, stiltgrass is a problem. Uh, it reduces the, uh, the fertility and the usefulness of their fields to their cattle, whether that's pasture or the production of hay. Um, so my understanding from that is that stiltgrass just is, is either not preferred by or eaten by, uh, by those livestock animals, or secondly, it has little to no nutritional value uh, compared to uh, other pasture grasses that uh, farmers are trying to um, trying to feed their 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 animals on. So I say no. It, no. Yeah. It, it is a problem for agriculture, uh, not an advantage. All right. Thank you, Jim. So we also had uh, questions uh, about herbicide, using herbicides close to or in proximity to water. So using grass specific herbicides in riparian zones. And our audience was looking for some clarification on what, what is too close? Is it a hundred feet away? Is it 25 feet away? Is it all the way up to the, to the bank as long as it's not wet? Um, I'm, my first uh, recommendation is to always read the label and look for that in that guidance in the environmental uh, portions of the label, but some general guidance on or rules of thumb for using grass specific herbicides. Yeah, so um, so th that is that is certainly something you, you, you really want to be careful um, about and uh, and um, definitely, definitely scour that label. Um, make sure that you, you're familiar with and understand all of the information on the label, as, as Beth said. Uh, that being said, uh, you often don't don't find a lot, a lot in the way of buffer, buffers, uh, widths on uh, on the labels. Um, and and you know, in, in that case, you need to you need to pay attention to things like you know, how much you're applying. Um, uh, the terrain, um, you know, whether the whether the the floodplain, whether the repairing area floods or not, um, you know, if, if I'm if I'm treating a uh, um, near a stream and I'm just spot spraying a few plants here and there, um, 10, 10 feet may be plenty. If if I'm using a, a large capacity sprayer and I'm spraying fields of you know huge quantity of stiltgrass. You're going to want to give give uh, give the waterway a, a a much larger larger buffer, you know, on the order of order of fifty feet or more, um, and then look at something like like glyphosate. Um, again, if if the uh, if if the floodplain floods regularly, you know, you have to be concerned about that. Some of these some of these grass specific herbicides say that uh, you, you know you're not supposed to use them um, within so many days of, of rainfall. So you know, Factor that in, um, and uh, so it's it's something you really want to be careful careful about. No no really hard and fast rules beyond what's on the label, but you, mm -hmm. you definitely want to keep keep these things out of water and look at something else if there's any chance of that happening, like either glyphosate or you know string trimming or something like that. So, mm -hmm. so there's a lot. Of, so sorry. Oh no no go ahead Jake. So, yeah, the same goes for the pre-emergence that that uh, that were listed. You know, those also are, are, are not to be used anywhere near water. So for sure. So. I, I want to ex express my empathy for everybody who's who's facing these situations. They they are, I, in my experience, the most challenging 
uh, stoke-grass control situations in floodplains, low wet areas, se seasonally flooded areas, et cetera. Um, so I, I resulted to a fair amount of hand pulling and hand weeding uh, as uh, late in the season, uh, or I could apply the herbicide um, grass specific when it's dry and, and you know, projected to be dry uh, for a period of time. Um, and, uh, and string trimmer, uh, again, is, is, is a great option. And if you're not will, uh, worried about uh, harming um, a, a lot of native plants, or even if you do harm some native plants, but there's a, a, a local seed bank nearby or surviving plants nearby, you can use glyphosate uh, around water. Uh, and my recommendation would be to stand in the stream and spray back towards the stream bank. Uh, even with glyphosate, get as little of that, of that in the water as you, as you possibly can, but it is safe. Uh, uh, that is um, glyphosate with a, an aquatic safe surfactant in it. Mm -hmm. All right, thanks, Jim. That answered a lot of questions. So another herbicide question about uh, grass specific herbicides. Luke asked, um, they've been using post herbicide, which is grass selective. So that's oxydem. Got a little uh, tongue tied there. They've had good results. They see more natives coming back uh, versus using a low dose glyphosate solution. What is the lowest concentration of post that has been found to be effective against still grass? Any experience with? with that product? You know, I, um, I, I'm, I haven't used post much. I know, I know Jim has used a set product, product and he, he may have, have, uh, mm. have some thoughts on that, but um, yeah, I could, I, um, I'd have to look that up. I, uh, so so yeah. Jake, Jake, I haven't, I haven't pushed the dosage, uh, you know, below what, what the label recommends, um, mm -hmm. which uh, as I recall is, is uh, roughly two ounces per, per, per gallon of water, um, as opposed to the clethodim, which is just a little below one ounce uh, uh, per gallon of water. Um, and uh, yeah, so to, 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 to try to go even lower, and the, the intention of the questioner might have been, can you be more selective with, uh, with uh, post or stoxidem if you use a lower dose? Might that might might that not harm uh, liersia, for example, when you've got a mixed uh, when you've got uh, stoke grass mixed in with white grass uh, or other native grasses like nimble well? Um, I don't know, Jake. Uh, what's your? Yeah, uh, I think to, to to zoom out just a little bit for a bigger answer to that question. I think that really is the question. How do you how how can you be selective on stoke grass alone? hold harmless the native grasses that it might be mixed in with, which herbicide uh, can you use and the lowest dose, or what's the dosage that you could use to be selective in that way? Yeah, I mean, we, we, have, had, we have had good results with, um, with the, uh, the um, Fluazifop product that we use. Uh, at, Fusilade? At, uh, which is Fusilade at, at a quarter of a percent. So that's one, that's one ounce for a full three gallon backpack. And as long as, you know, you have to be careful about the actual rate you're putting down, you know, as long as you're not over, over, um, uh, over applying, as long as you're spraying something like, uh, um, you know, on the, on the order of 30 gallons or so of spray per, per acre, uh, native grasses are, 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 come through pretty well unscathed, um, with, these, Could you, these for, I doubt there are many people here that are applying herbicide on that, <laughs> on that scale. Yeah. Uh, could you translate 30 gallons per acre uh, to the actual, uh, uh, actual use of a backpack sprayer um, and the passage of a wand across a swath? Yeah, so, uh, so it's, yeah, I mean, so, so it's essentially sprayed away. So, so it's, you know, you, you, you're you're spraying the plants um, so that they're 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 well covered, but they're not the tips of the leaves aren't aren't dripping. Um, you know, you're great. Um, and and um, 
yeah, it's 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 kind of <laughs> kind of hard to describe beyond that without without a, an illustration or a video or something. But uh, but um, but yeah, I mean, thirty gallons, thirty to forty gallons per acre is typically typically what you would you would apply um, uh, on an acre of ground that 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 required thorough treatment. So, so yeah. that, that, that's or, at a quarter percent of fuselage, yeah. uh, it's 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 pretty selective for stiltgrass. I mean, stiltgrass is just a very easy plant to kill. That's great, because I think a lot of us are, are facing stiltgrass mixed in with nimble wheel or, yeah. uh, or, or white grass or others. Deer tongue can be mixed in too, depending on where it is. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. All right, um, we, we're gonna do five more minutes of, of questions and then we'll wrap up the presentation. Um, so sorry if we don't get to, to your question and remember you can send us an email at info at and we can, we can help you out with that. Um, so another, another question, we had a number of questions about the impacts of herbicides on insects and wildlife, particular uh, wildlife was like toads and other amphibians. Um, can you talk a little bit about, about that and your experience and some ways to, to mitigate that? And before you, before you start with your answer, I would like to refer, um, if you didn't see PRISM spring program, we did a really deep dive into uh, pollinators, invasive plants and herbicides. And that can be found on PRISM's webpage and, and look for quarterly meeting archives and you can watch the video and review the resources there. Um, so that might answer some of your questions. So now Jake, I will, yeah. I will let you answer the question. Sure, sure. So, so yeah, I mean, these, there, there is some evidence that, that certainly direct spray of these, these grass specifics um, uh, is it, not the greatest thing for insects, um, uh, you know, but but hopefully, what you're what you're doing is you're you're vastly improving the habitat for <laughs> for um, for insect life in the area that, that you're uh, that, that you're um, that you're working in. I mean, these these still grass monocultures aren't, aren't great insect habitats. So so um, so you know the, the, the sacrifice. <laughs> maybe it, maybe it sounds a little. Uh, Little harsh to say, but you know the, the loss of a few insects that may that may be directly impacted by uh, uh, that may be directly sprayed um, should be more than offset by the improvement in in insect habitat that results from from you know concerted sustained effort to uh, to um, to remove still grass and uh, you know the, the the same is true for other for other creatures out there um, uh, you know, the the um, the, uh, the benefits are, are, are hopefully out, out outweighing the costs. If, um, um, yeah, oh, sorry, I, anything to add? To, to, to to, yeah. Just to add, add on there, um, from time to time, uh, I'm, I'm applying a, a grass specific out in the forest uh, on a random patch of stilt grass, and I happen to hit a toad. Uh, and that's horrifying to me. Yeah. Uh, and because I understand that it could be lethal to them. And so I always carry around with me a flask of water yeah. uh, when I'm uh, applying grass specific and I, I, I give the animal a bath mm -hmm. if it'll stay in place um, and tr try to wash the herb side off. Yeah. So I th think that if th these things can happen by mistake, um, nobody's fault, they, the, the animal could be hiding under under vegetation, under a leaf, and uh, you might just see it after you've made made the spray, or or, or it jumps and moves. Uh, at that point, um, you can try a little rescue there. Yeah, that's that's a great great point. Yeah, we do we do the same thing. We carry water bottles around on um, on carabiners, and and um, and I've have certainly done that. Uh, um, yeah, I mean, and and you know, like I pointed out, there there certainly are other options. If, if you really do not want to use a, a, a um, synthetic herbicide, uh, you know you you can still do it. <laughs> you, 
you may may have a hard time doing it at the scale that that you can do it with. Uh, I, I can't I can't imagine ask the pelargonic acid or vinegar is going to be any more pleasant though. Oh no no yeah yeah but yeah yeah that's, or that's, or that's, a flamethrower. That's definitely definitely true. Yes yes so, so good yes good good point or a string trimmer for that matter. <laughs> yeah so, yeah. Yeah, and just to follow up on that, I, I too have uh, rinsed off a toad and a box turtle and other creatures that were inadvertently uh, sprayed during uh, siltgrass control efforts. Um, something to keep in mind when, when using herbicides. So the greatest risk of exposure for insects and pollinators in particular is gonna be when a, flat, when a plant is in flower. And so if you are applying herbicide when a plant is in flower, you're gonna hit uh, a bee, for example, or other pollinators, or uh, they're going to pick up residual um, chemicals that might be in the pollen or from, from exposure uh, visiting the plant. So one, don't spray when plants are in flower. And two, with stiltgrass, Stiltgrass is primarily pollinated by wind pollination. So you're not going to have a great chance of encountering a lot of pollinators on Japanese stiltgrass, for example. But if there are other plants in the area that are flowering, that are desirable native plants, then I uh, certainly need to be mindful to not have any overspray or um, unintended treatment or spray of those, those plants. So um, something to keep in mind. Yeah, that's a great So with point. that, yeah. I, thank point. you, Jay. <laughs> uh, with that, I think we'll go ahead and wrap up today's program. Um, just, uh, we've had a few requests for folks to be able to save the chat. And I am sorry, I can't seem to turn that function on for our audience to save the chat themselves. So we will be sending a copy of today's chat and all of the Q&A questions, along with the slides from today's presenters and a link to, to the recording. So look for that email out within the next couple of days. Um, again, I'm sorry about the, the chat. We'll have to figure that out. And it's hard to, to do like three things at once when we're running these programs. So thanks for your, your patience. Um, but we'll go ahead and, and wrap up. And I just wanna say, Thanks to one Natalie and Tom for helping to manage today's question and answers. Again, send us an email, info at blueridgeprism.org if you have follow-up questions afterwards. And a big thanks to, to Jim Hurley and Jake Hughes for taking the time to talk with us today and answer your questions and for developing their excellent presentations and information around stiltgrass. And thanks to each of you for joining us today. I'm really glad to, to see that it, this program was so well attended and we hope to see you real soon in another prison event. So thank you everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thanks all, be well. So I'm gonna stop recording.